uh, meeting of the commission to order, please. Um, if Megan, if you could call the roll and let us know who's on the telephone, I would appreciate it, please. Mr. Beck? Here. Senator Birdwell? Present. Senator Mimosa? Senator Huffman? Senator Nichols? Here. Representative Hunter? Here. Representative Langraff? Representative Norris? Representative Sherman? Here. Representative Langrath here. Walked in. They called me a name. Judge Jameson. Chief Justice Jefferson. Here. Ms. Here. Mr. Oliveira. Here. Chief Justice Phillips. Here. I think Representative Langrath came in. Um, right okay, well, welcome everyone to our meeting, and I'd especially like to uh, welcome Senator Birdwell, who could not uh, be at our first meeting. He had an excuse that for a very important meeting in Washington, D.C. No, it was uh, rendering, if I may, without sounding correctly, Mr. Chairman, it was not a, a meeting in D.C., but we were rendering final honors at Arlington National Cemetery. Right. And, and you, you told me that. Uh, and anyway, welcome. We're glad yes, to have you. Thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda, and I hope everybody's had the opportunity to read the minutes of our uh, January 9 meeting. Um, if so, I would... I would entertain a motion to adopt the minutes of our last meeting. So moved. Got here a second. Second. And moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor of approval signify by saying aye. 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 Minutes are approved. Uh, we are fortunate to have with us this morning uh, Keith Ingram, who is the division director with the Secretary of State's office, who um, agreed to appear and talk to us a little bit about elections. Uh, so Keith, I'm going to just turn the program over to you, and uh, I'm sure people will have questions, but uh, if you could uh, proceed, I'd appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, Keith Ingram, I've been the director of the Elections Division for eight years, one month, six days. Not that anybody's counting. Um, and uh, I've been a lawyer for almost 27 years, and I'm happy to be here today. Uh, a little bit about where we are. We've got over 16,100,000 registered voters uh, for this primary election. We'll start early voting in person next week. Of course, mail ballots are out right now. Um, one thing that's going to be different this year than uh, has been ever, or at least in a long time in Texas, is that there will not be the option of one punch uh, straight ticket voting this November. Uh, so we anticipate that uh, a couple of things are going to happen. We're going to have more voters than we've ever had before. We expect to break 9 million in turnout, um, and we're going to have them, those voters taking longer in the polling booths. Quite a few counties in the last year have upgraded their voting systems, and most voters are going to vote on a hybrid system. And that means that they're going to make their selections on a ballot marking device, a touch screen, and then they're going to take the paper card and put it into a precinct scanner to tabulate the votes. Um, so this is going to be new to a lot of voters and anticipate that that's going to also uh, increase the time. So we've told the counties to prepare for Easter Sunday Plus um, and uh, to have all the equipment that they can have uh, on hand uh, and that uh, be ready to help educate the voters with the new equipment. Uh, it's just going to be a combination of factors that's going to be a very complicated, difficult, long election this November. Um, so we're doing the best we can to train the poll workers and get the counties ready, but there, we anticipate there will be some problems and delays someplace. We just don't know where. Well, hopefully we're not going to have an Iowa situation. We're not going to have an Iowa situation if I can help it. No, sir. <laughs> <laughs> all, of our, all of our apps get tested well in advance of the election. Yes. Have you given thought to or... or uh, calculated what the drop-off will be as a result of no straight ticket voting and down ballot? We have nothing to compare it to. Um, so we, we honestly don't know. Uh, there's always, always ballot drop-off as you go down ballot. Um, you know, in, in past elections, when you have a partisan election at the top of the ballot, then you could have a school district or city or water district underneath that. Uh, the, the turnout for the lower ones is always much less, but I don't know how it will be within the partisan election this year. Do you, you happen to recall how long the ballot is for Harris County, for example? Harris County famously has one of the longest ballots in the country. And of course, they also have to do it in uh, Mandarin and Vietnamese, as well as English and Spanish. Um, their ballot, I don't know how long it will be, but the majority of the length 
is because of judicial races. <coughs> and how many judicial races are there in Harris County, for example? I don't know. Just approximately. I, anywhere from 45 to 60, I believe. Oh, is forty-five? 45? Hmm? 60. 45 to 60 district courts. That's not including county courts and, of course, appellate courts and Supreme Courts and Courts of Criminal Appeals. Senator, um, what is the breakout of cycles of those respective uh, judicial races? As an example, uh, we'll go through redistricting in 2022. All senators will be up. Then we draw a lottery to see who goes back to the alternating. Of those 40 to 50 judicial selections, are they divided or are they every four years? So uh, is there a, go ahead. There is a, a bit of a stagger. It, historically, we had a constitutional requirement that, you know, certain races, certain offices be on the ballot on certain years. Uh, that has uh, gone away uh, about 40 years ago. And as new courts are added, they're added on whatever cycle they're on. So there is a disproportionate number of district courts that are up in the governor's year, but still there's going to be quite a few in the presidential year. Thank you. <coughs> yes, Senator. In the areas where you do have uh, drop-off, uh, you do have data, would it be possible to find out what the percent drop-off is when you get into, when you have one ballot where you, you, know, you got trade party taking it top? straight party voting at the top, but then they have to go check off at the bottom. Is it 5%, 10%, 20% drop off? I, I have no idea as I stand here today, but I can certainly do that research. I think that would be important <coughs> to find out at least approximately what the drop off is. Sure. Yeah, and, and that can be done. Uh, it's not that complicated to get the percentage of drop off <coughs> from the top of the ticket down there halfway down on the judicial races. No, there's definitely research on that. Will, will there be a complete analysis of, of the significance of what happens in this election? In other words, um, what percentage of the judicial races uh, people did not vote in uh, because it was so down ballot? I mean, will there be a complete analysis that will be done by your office? Um, we're going to have more data than we've ever had before uh, for this election cycle. The legislature, the last couple of sessions, has uh, required more and more uh, that our office gather more and more data. Um, and so we're going to have more data for county races as well as district races than we've ever had before, and we'll have it sooner than we've ever had it. So yes, sir. Yes. Chairman, thank you. Uh, of the uh, appointments that have been made, or I guess what I'm asking is the percentage of judges that are on the ballot that were initially appointed, uh, what are we looking at as far as those uh, elections and turnover, perhaps? Possibly. I honestly have no idea. I haven't been keeping track of how many vacancies we've had that the governor's filled. Okay. I don't know. Can you get that data for us? Well, I mean, that's, that's been a big concern. Yeah. Because it won't say anything about county courts at law. But to get that, I would have to talk right. to county commissioners. But it will. I can get it for district courts. Yeah, and that's what I'm most concerned about is the district courts because on the county level, it seems, especially in the metropolitan areas, but also the rural areas, the commissioners typically, uh, they are, since it is partisan races that they're in, they're appointing folks that are typically of the same party. Uh, but on, on our level, it's, it's different. Uh, and uh, there are a lot, at least we are informed that there are a lot of folks, a lot of attorneys who will not accept the appointment because it's going to be short term they perceive that it will be short term so just interested to know uh, what the number is sure i think another data point that would be helpful uh, has to do with um, the election of judges in the rural areas as opposed to the large metropolitan areas because there's a pretty good argument that can be made that people in the rural areas really know their judges if that's so, you would think that they would actually vote in all of the judicial races down ballot, whereas that may not be true in, in metropolitan areas like Harris County, where there's so many judges, even the lawyers don't know who they are. So would you be able to break that data out between the larger metropolitan areas and the more rural areas? Yes, sir. Thank you. And also on the appointment, um, I believe that the county commissioners are uh, in addition to the district judges. Good. <clears throat> OK, 
18th, we didn't mean to give you all these assignments. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to do it. But you're the keeper of the data, so I think if you can provide this information to us, that'd be very, very helpful. Yes, sir. Uh, we can do it. Help us in the tasks that we've been assigned. Any other questions <clears throat> of uh, Mr. Ingram? Um, it has. Uh, I have heard the elder thinking about maybe another election day, perhaps. Uh, just in that regard, we've got four uniform election dates in every two-year cycle. We've got the first Saturday in May of the odd number and the even-numbered year, and of course the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November for both. Um, there is a, a restriction on the May of even-numbered years. Uh, counties can't hold an election then, and so if there were uh, to be a judicial race, that would be a county-based election. <coughs> so that uh, couldn't happen in the even-numbered years. So I think it's three possibilities. One of which is being used now. November. Well, what is the cost of holding an election? So, say, if, if this commission recommended and the legislature thought it was a good idea to hold the election of judges or the selection of judges uh, on a separate day without any other offices, what, what's the cost of that? Um, I don't really know how much it costs to have a, an election in a county. I do know that the state pays for the primary election, and we do not pay for early voting during the primary election, but the primary election cost about $15 million statewide, uh, and that's not including early voting. Senator? Yeah, and, and in terms of the, um, just for discussion purposes, we want to discuss uh, a day other than the, da the days that are now scheduled. Uh, would you all have some at least suggestions of which would be the best days? Um, just look at the whole picture. Absolutely. No, we could do that. There used to be four uniform election dates in a year. Uh, there was one in April and one in September, in addition to the one in May and November. Uh, so we could look at those. Okay. Any other questions, Mr. Ingram? If not, Keith, thank you very, very much. It's been very helpful. Thank you all. Good luck in your work. <coughs> and if you could get us all these uh, results of these assignments as soon as you can, we'd appreciate it. I will. I'll get them to Megan. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda has to do with the working group updates. Uh, let me begin with uh, former Chief Justice Tom Phillips. Could you please report to us on the work of your group? Uh, yes. We are the uh, elections subgroup. Uh, Senator Nickel and Nina Hosa, Representative Manharis, Judge Jameson, and myself. And our charge is critique the current system of partisan elections, provide the pros and cons of nonpartisan elections, and discuss the usefulness of retention elections in a new system. Uh, so to begin working on that charge, we had an organizational telephone meeting last week. And I asked the committees to, to, everybody on the committee to come up with three advantages of partisan elections and three advantages of nonpartisan elections. And we just kind of make a list to sort of stimulate thinking. Uh, and the results, if I may give them, I'll, I'll just read these reasons out. Uh, partisan elections, advantages. Uh, first, they provide, and they can provide an advantage for the voters. The average citizen does not know what qualifications a judge must or should have to serve the public and does not know how they match to these qualifications. So partisan elections serve as an asset for voters and may provide a comfort level for them in voting in that it allows them to align their votes with the party they most align with. If you are a Republican or a Democrat, you know that if you vote for a candidate who aligns with your chosen party, they will most likely align <coughs> with your own political views. And I'll just, there was one guy in Houston who ran on four, four different times on four different parties, but he didn't ever win, so we don't know if he would have behaved differently with a different, uh, with a different label. Uh, continuing on advantages of partisan election, it gives the candidates more access to knowledgeable and enthusiastic campaign volunteers than you can get if you're running a nonpartisan race. It provides access to pre-organized political events with attendees who are probably sympathetic to you, presumptively, uh, and are willing to listen to you speak and give your views. It gives an opportunity for a candidate to get a more diverse source of funding than just lawyers, litigants, and your personal friends. 
That is, there are some people who will su support you financially and work for you just because you're of a particular political party. Uh, if you have to run in both primary and maybe a runoff in a general election, it enhances your accountability more than just a single shot race might. In urban areas, it permits candidates to spend their funds more effectively and efficiently by running joint campaigns or joint advertising pieces uh, so that you can spread the cost out and reach more voters. It may result in cheaper campaigns as candidates need not appeal to those voters who are certain to support or oppose them merely because of their party label. And that was particularly true in the straight party ticket days. Uh, when I was campaigning, I, did, I, I spent my time in swing areas and not areas that, you know, I could only lose votes if they knew who I was or areas where I wasn't going to get votes no matter how good I, uh, how, how strongly I tried to appeal. Uh, it affords some protection for candidates with a bad name, and we have some horror stories from California and other places where somebody with an unfamiliar name or a name that sounds like a notorious criminal or political figure uh, gets beat. Uh, in some circumstances, party leaders can exercise influence to dissuade unqualified candidates from seeking office at all or to steer them into uh, races where they're not running against the best candidates on the other side. Uh, whereas if it's just a nonpartisan race, you show up and file, those people uh, might be more likely to run in a place that does not do the most good for the system. Now, advantages of, of nonpartisan elections. It avoids the partisan sweeps that have driven out so many judges. Uh, irrespective of their qualifications in the past. It may enhance the pool of potential judges uh, because candidates for election or appointment will have less fear that their retention in office will be affected by political forces unrelated to their job performance. It may attract good candidates who lack partisan affiliations or who are affiliated with the wrong party for the area that they live in. Uh, it may it gives definitely a shorter campaign season uh, because you don't have to run in both primary and general elections uh, and that might reduce total campaign expenditure maybe uh, although there's a, a countervailing thing of you have to reach more voters uh, and tell them more about yourself uh, it avoids the dangers caused by low turnouts in primaries that are increasingly typical for both parties uh, which leads to in essence, the judge being chosen by a very small subset of the citizenry in those areas of the state, which are most areas where the general elections are not going to be competitive. Uh, it would help the voters perceive judicial officers as different from elected policy makers. Would enhance confidence in the integrity of the process from non-Texans uh, who appear before our courts and are not used to the idea of judges having a partisan label. Uh, and it might make judges a less attractive pool uh, for candidates for non-judicial office. <clears throat> a few years ago, seven of Texas's 36 congressional delegates were, uh, members were former judges, which I've done a study, but I suspect that's not true of any other state. Uh, and you may regard that as a good thing or a bad thing, but nonpartisan elections, probably they'd be the people would be less identified as someone who might take a political role. A few open questions. Uh, which of these systems would lead to less expensive judicial races? Which system would better encourage good judges to be left unchallenged and bad judges to be opposed and defeated? Which system would lead to less improper pressure on candidates and incumbents from uh, interest groups, litigants, and political parties? Uh, would either system be better served by holding the election on some day <coughs> other than the regular primary and general election dates, which we just talked about with Mr. Ingram? Uh, would a cross-filing system uh, maximize the best features of both systems and minimize the worst? Texas only did this once in 1952, but it's rather common in California and New York that you can file in more than one party. I don't know of any state that's ever forced that. Uh, but uh, I myself would be suspicious of a judge who said I only want to be the judge of Democrats and so I'm not following the Republican Party or vice versa. And you could man mandate it. 
which <coughs> would double the filing fees for political parties and would also uh, in this day of YouTube and uh, telephone uh, films would make uh, would make it interesting for comments judgments would might say to different groups. In other words, they have to give a more standard message, I would think. Uh, which system would better allow judicial candidates to educate the voters about the difference in the judicial role uh, and the legislative and executive roles? That's one of the main advantages of an election system uh, is the judges are able to go explain to large groups of people what judges do uh, and why they make decisions that are unpopular. Which, which system would best do that? Uh, and regardless of the system chosen, should some or all judges who seek re-election <coughs> be required to run on a retention ballot? That is a yes-no race. Uh, we were asked to do that in light of if we change the system. But well, we don't know if we change the system. Would this change alone be a good idea? Uh, Illinois and Pennsylvania uh, and New Mexico after an initial appointment uh, the, all those states have an initial partisan election, but then you run for re-election by retention, which uh, permits voters to throw the, the bums out and keeps the judges accountable, but it avoids the party sweeps. Uh, and if, so if you're going to do that only for some judges or only some of the time, there have been proposals in the past that you have a party election, a retention election, and then a party election, and you run for your third term. Uh, how would you design that? There have been some talk that partisan that a retention election is not real elections, and so I have, as a present for anybody who wants it, as many buttons as you want from a retention <laughs> campaign in Illinois. This judge was retained, but he had a little racketeering and bribery problem and uh, later resided elsewhere. Uh, <laughs> The other thing that our committee have done, and the final thing, is uh, we, as a group, as a whole, in the legislation, uh, this whole committee, this commission, is uh, obligated to reach out to other states and see how they're doing, you know, what their experience has been with their own system and whether they're happy or unhappy. And so, uh, with Megan's help, we designed a questionnaire that we are going to send to the Chief Justice and the uh, Head of the Office of Court Administration in each of the other states, and you have that in front of you. And it has not been sent yet, so to the extent that uh, we get input, that this could be improved, and of course any survey can always be improved, uh, we very much appreciate your input on it. Or to the extent that you're in a committee that you think some of your questions should, uh, from your subcommittee should be asked that are not covered by this, uh, let us know. We'd like to get the survey back by early April to help us. And as you can see, there's some open-ended questions at the end. And one is, we asked the Chief Justice and the uh, OCA Director, who in your state has information about election systems that could help us? So we're, we're hoping to use this as a shorthand survey to find the right people to reach out to with data about different systems and ideas and horror stories or, what, or whatever else you can think of that might help us come up with the right answer for Texas. Thank you. I, I know that uh, the commissioners are getting this for the first time. Is there any reason why whatever input you want to have on this uh, draft can't be completed by the end of this week? It could be in, you know, roughly a little more than three days. Any reason why? Give them the lead Yeah, that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, I'm just trying to keep keep the momentum going here. Well, yes, Senator. My, my, if I may, Mr. Chairman, my only concern would be is, is this is the first I'm hearing it, and this is the opportunity to discuss it. Um, usually, uh, I, I won't speak for the House members, but on the Senate side, we'll get our materials. Anything. 72, and sometimes shorter, but for an opportunity for staff, that way, Right now, I'm just in the receive mode without any opportunity to study, have any conversation with the chief uh, in regards to this. So I'm sitting here dead in the water rather than having an opportunity to provide you know, rigor and a rigorous analysis of my own and my own staff. So I, it's not being disrespectful to the to former chief. I just I have a different ex expectation of coming into a hearing like this 
rather than just simply turning on receive without being able to send. I think that's a fair point. That's a very fair point. Um, so that, how, would, how would you suggest we proceed at this point? Uh, you're getting this for the first time today. Um, I'd like to see it so I can read it. There were, there were certainly things that I have concerns with. There, there may be some elements that I have uh, agreement with. Um, I just, from having reviewed the last hearing, um, I just don't want there to be the, okay, group think is that this is, this is a great answer and we're all in concurrence. It doesn't mean we have to take votes on the item. I just, I don't want to just, okay, here's the report next. So I'm not really sure what the right answer is, but um, I'd, I'd rather walk in informed to have an informed discussion, not just the chiefs informed, because that's, I mean, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Liberato was in charge of ours. We, you know, I had the opportunity to read it uh, last weekend. So, so, uh, uh, so, Sir Burgo, are you just asking for more time to be able to adjust the materials? No, I, mean, I just, I just want to be able to have it and read it so that when it's now the, if an opportunity to ask questions of the, the work group, I don't even have the material in front of me, so it's okay. that, that's all I'm asking Mr. for. Mr. Is Mr. Chairman, how far would it set us back if we, we if we put this on the agenda for the next meeting to discuss and to give people? Or, or do we need to get it out quicker than that? I don't think we need to get it out quicker. I mean, this is all, just, just to be clear, uh, as you may have noted in the minutes, uh, at our last meeting, no decisions were made about anything. And I assume that when we leave this meeting, no decisions will be made on anything. We're basically in an information gathering mode, as I see it, trying to figure out what all the arguments are in favor of this alternative, what the counter arguments are against that alternative, and so on and so on and so forth. The legislature has told us to look at at least seven and perhaps more alternatives. So the way I'm viewing this is we are still in information gathering mode, as illustrated by the questioning of Keith Ingram here this morning. So nothing, Senator, is intended to, to suggest that somehow this report is accepted, that it's in concrete, and we can't in any way discuss it or change it. Okay. So I just want to make that very clear. And, I'm, and I'm, your, your reaffirmation of the charter of the commission is, is absolutely accurate. That it's, it's a go look and evaluate and, and make recommendations. Um, I just, I'm just expecting. <laughs> well, yeah. for the future, we'll make certain that we get this information out uh, um, much earlier. Okay. And I'll say at least 72 you. hours if that. That's okay. Yes, and Megan, and one thing um, that we could probably that I was thinking that might be helpful because there are three different work groups that um, so the, this uh, um, Chief Justice Phillips work group did exchange emails back and forth with this information. So maybe we can set up a Dropbox or something like to that effect that all of the members can see what the other work groups are working on. So that there's one more. I think silos. Senator Bird was saying more than that. He wants the opportunity to actually discuss with the various chairs of the subgroup. And, and really kind of push back, test, and, and make certain that uh, he knows exactly what the recommendation of the group it may be. Is that essentially right, Senator? Yes. Okay. I want to have a command of the material being presented. Okay. That's a fair point. If, if I may follow up with a question um, to uh, former Chief Justice Phillips, um, as you may remember from our last meeting, um, one of the problems with our current system that was identified was um, expense, the appearance of impropriety by lawyers who have to appear before a judge and suddenly were on that judge's finance committee and made a, a major contribution and so on and so forth. With respect to the difference, I mean, is there much difference in the expense that a judge is going to incur between the partisan election and the nonpartisan election? It seems to me they're still going to have to get out there and, and convince the public that they ought to be elected. Yes. Yeah, Texas is unusual because so many of our judicial races are contested. And that was not the case back when we were a one-party state, of course. Uh, and 
is not the case in a lot of states with vigorous two-party competition, but it's just not the culture of the, the local <coughs> community. You don't challenge a judge who's coming to work and doing their best, but, but you do here. Uh, so we really, you know, we don't know, and that's part of what, you know, we'd like to find out from other states as best we can. A nonpartisan race could be much more expensive than a partisan race. I can certainly see that. Uh, because you don't have the party to fall back on. You don't have these joint campaign brochures. You, you, it's, you've got to reach the voters yourself, as in, say, a city council race in Dallas or Houston expensive propositions. But it may be that, a, that many fewer races are contested. And there again, we just don't know, and that depends on some ballot access. For instance, the, the signatures now, uh, as I understand it, are not too big a hurdle in local races where, <coughs> help me, 500 signatures required to get on the ballot in the urban areas for district judge. I think it is. But you go to political party events and get those. Well, it's a nonpartisan race. That might be a real hurdle. That might be a real hurdle. You better be a member of a big church or something. Uh, so I just don't. If, if say there's only 10% as many contested races under that system as there are here, the total <coughs> net, uh, expense is going to be a lot less, even if individual races are more. Yeah, I would think that a nonpartisan elections would be somewhat more expensive in the sense that, uh, you're right, uh, Chief, you're not um, teaming up with either party. Number two, many times I know when I uh, run for and have an opponent, I'm out there uh, campaigning, uh, some of the uh, judges uh, form coalitions or when you GOTV, uh, they, get, they have that type of support which they will not have in a nonpartisan election. So I would tend to agree with Chief Justice Phillips that uh, nonpartisan elections will cost all you more money. Uh, and, and maybe in a way, that's not uh, to say that I'll be a, a uh, negative, or only because you're trying to educate the public as to the qualifications of the judge, is what they're focused on, and not on the party. I do think if you're in a highly contested area, you have a primary and maybe a runoff in a general election, that's a very expensive process. And also there is an expense to just being running, particularly if you have camp paid campaign workers. So a nonpartisan race, if it lasts three months instead of a year and three months, uh, could be cheaper. It's just, there's a lot of opinions here, and obviously what we're after is the best judge we can get. Uh, and I do think one other thing, Representative Hinojosa said, the, the money in a nonpartisan race, I think, will be even more lawyer and party litigant driven than under the party, under the current system. I'll just, <coughs> the only thing I'll add <coughs> about the nonpartisan is uh, nonpartisan race can be partisan uh, because people um, latch on to um, interest groups um, just as they would in a partisan election. So, for example, I'm nonpartisan. I'm running in Harris County, but I'm going to get the support of, you know, this this I forget the name of the list that you know they send out the their the endorsements, the whatever the link letter, link letter, you know that sort of thing, and that's an indication to the groups that receive those lists that this is Republican, and the same thing will happen on the Democratic side. There are some states that are you know nonpartisan in name, but it is very clear. To everybody um, who the judge is uh, affiliated with, um, so it doesn't completely eliminate the partisan character, and I do think it adds some expense in terms of having to get your name out there. You, you've got to really advertise. Uh, so. And the, the <coughs> Supreme Court races in a number of so-called nonpartisan states are very definitely partisan. Right. As in Wisconsin, it's not partisan, but the political parties are tooth and tong right, in those races. I was thinking more about the district court races, which, at least in most states, have not gotten down to where parties <coughs> endorse in every race and the slates pick their candidates, but it certainly could. There's no reason. Senator Berglund, Mr. Chairman, may I ask a, a question of Chief Justice? Justice, did, did, uh, did General Report look at, based on what just well, just Jefferson just said, make me think. Did your report look at any sort of trifurcation where you're looking at we'll do something different for district judges than we would do for appellate judges than we would do for statewide? Well, that, did I? 
that's, 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 that's an open friendly. question, and we are we're not we don't have anything in writing other than the questionnaire that we propose. Which oh okay, so I there there so I, I stand corrected. Then there wasn't a like what our work group did to no. You were the only work group that put out a written report to the others. Although I'd already gone home at the time. <laughs> but, um, uh, I think that's right, Wallace. I mean, we exchange notes among okay. our group, uh, but this is our only written product, okay. Uh, okay. and we're Which not a proposed point. survey. Right. And we're also, I mean, we're not to the point of recommending anything or anything else. I think, as far as advantages, uh, we did not talk about that. I'm sure we will, and that's another thing you can teach it round or flat. I mean, uh, in most states, they tend to go first with some type of appointed system for the appellate courts or sometimes only the highest court. Uh, I think those, my own view has always been that the Supreme Court uh, writes on 30 some odd different sets of rules and appoints commissions. You know, they do a number of things uh, by writing all the procedural rules and the rules of discipline. It's sort of a legislative body and has more the, reason to be identified with causes me a cringe to hear that from a, a judicial branch, former judicial branch officer. It's in the, the constitution. Uh, it's uh, in the constitution. Uh, 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 we're responsible. You know, right. I, I guess my is, again, not to. Uh, <coughs> I, I thank you for for your your deference, Chairman. I, it's what you and I spoke about on the phone. Right. I guess because my my concern is is that we may be in this building. You know, where it's the seal of the, the state of Texas, the judicial branch, but just the judicial branch isn't our customer. People of the state of Texas are our customer. <coughs> that's what I'm absolutely concerned with. I, I would hope we all we all agree with that. I mean, what we want is the is a system that is gives the fairest system of justice we can and that is perceived that way both by our own citizens and other places in the world thank you mr chief thank you thank you chairman just a, a quick uh, comment uh sir i think uh sir nichols uh talked about uh in the rural counties which are very different than the urban counties like harris county uh where the voters do know the judges uh, they go to the church they go shopping they see them around town uh, so I guess maybe that's what you're talking about in terms of differentiating between uh, Supreme Court justices and, and Court of Appeal judges if, if, uh, compared to district judges, uh, a different election system maybe. Uh, I don't know, but I'm, I'm, Sam Nichols have pointed that out in terms of um, uh, some <coughs> problems that exist in some of the urban areas but not exist in the rural areas. But the election of local judges. There, there is, there's merit to that argument that um, but for those those judicial districts that are multi-county, I don't think there's merit to that argument. Um, when you've got three counties, and I mean, you know, it depends on where the the, the seat of the of the bench is actually located. I, I guess my concern is is if you, if we looked at trifurcating, if we're going to treat the Supreme Court differently than the appellate courts, you know, we got 14 of those, and then we're going to we get you know 400 something district judges. I'm not sure what that would look like. I don't know that that's the, the, the right thing to do, but that's why I asked the yeah. chief if they had looked at, because ultimately the, the people of the state of Texas are the ones who decides who sits in those seats. Well, and that's the ultimate authority is, is the consent of the governor. David, could I, I think Representative Sherman, do you have a question? Yeah, well, I, I think what Senator Birdwell says is right on spot in regards to serving the people of Texas. And when you look at the issues of whether the judges are competent, independent, fair, and accountable, how do you achieve that without some form of democracy as a part of the process? Yeah, because uh, listening to, just one second, listening yeah, I'm sorry, to I'm Justice, sorry. Chief Justice uh, Jefferson or reading his uh, memo regarding uh, one of the factors that he learned or was surprised about that we as elected officials, uh, Representative Landgraf, we, we have to go out and buy for votes, right, to uh, get folks to uh, 
support us. But the judicial branch, especially if you're appointed initially, as, as you were, I understand, uh, it's a surprise to you uh, the number of people that are not even aware that judges are elected. So not only do we have the challenge of ensuring that they understand the qualifications of a judge, but we also have to get them to understand that they're a part of the process of selecting the judges. So, you know, to me, it would be like someone as, you know, as a, as a former city manager, I've got someone that I'm hiring. I don't even know what qualifications they must have to get the job and now I'm thrust into the position of selecting who's going to be the most qualified <coughs> so it's it's a it's a real issue that well, to your, to your to point have. representative Sherman that we circulated earlier that 2014 Texas Tech survey that was done one of the questions asked was who is the Chief Justice of the Texas Supreme Court uh, only 16% said Nathan Heck, 17% said Greg Abbott. Um, so there's a lot of misinformation out there. Yes, Chip. Yeah, following up on the uh, comments from Representative Sherman and Senator Birdwell, uh, I did a scientific uh, survey to your point this morning, and my Uber driver did not know that uh, <laughs> in Texas. So there you have it. Quite a vigorous study. So yeah. <laughs> Very rigorous. <laughs> Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, it's one out of one. So, uh, but uh, but to the point that Senator Birdwell made about who our customers are, uh, certainly uh, the citizens of Texas are our customers and our our primary customers. But also, uh, we have to take into account <clears throat> the people that are uh, involved in our justice system, and not all of them are citizens of Texas. We have people companies from Delaware and New York and other places who are uh, sometimes defendants in our justice system. And we have to make sure that they believe that we have a system with integrity. And uh, I've made this point before, but the money that we spent, we spend and who spends it and how the judges solicit that money uh, undermines confidence in our, in our justice system. And it is especially acute outside the state, uh, where uh, businesses and companies and people uh, were brought into this state either involuntarily as defendants or, or file here. Uh, they lack confidence in our system because of the money. Well, what's that? Is there another question down here? All right, any other questions of uh, Chief Justice Phillips before we move on to the next report? one process thought in terms of the um, uh, survey, which I think is a great idea, good, good work. We do know for all the states, and from a fairly recent uh, study, what their system is. And I'm just thinking, your experience in sending out surveys, the shorter they are, the more likely they are to get answered. Uh, now, it may be that the nature of who we're sending this to, uh, that wouldn't be an issue. Uh, but I'm just wondering if we could s at least consider, not make a decision, because I think this is certainly up to your work group, but maybe consider taking out those kinds of questions uh, and really focus on the ones that are, are you know, make, make a, a big difference. Although, you know, it's going to really vary. I did the initial, an initial questionnaire, which, which, and that which split to... <laughs> After our first few questions, yeah. it split into nine different ones oh, that we yeah, would send sure, to people, sure, depending sure. on their system. And yeah. uh, I think the, the smart folks decided that was too cumbersome, or we might, I don't know, it's in the wrong one, the wrong people. Uh, but you Justice, Chief Justice Hecht is right now president of the Conference of okay. Chiefs, and uh, David Slayton is at least on the he's at least on the board of directors of Costco, if not in line mm -hmm. to be head of that. So we think if they will sign our letter, we'll get a better return percentage than we would if it was some has-been. I, <laughs> I, 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 think, I think we will. And we also know Mary McQueen, who's the head of the National Center for State Courts, um, is supportive. So I think we'll get a pretty good return. My understanding is that she's actually made some suggested changes in the questionnaire. Is that not correct, Tom? Thank you. 
Right, so um, originally they, um, the National Center for State Courts didn't think that we would get uh, chiefs and state court administrators that would be forthcoming and criticizing their system um, if it was just responding to a letter. So they thought that putting it in a survey format where they could still remain anonymous, but based on their responses, we could guess who oh, okay. they were. And it also be anonymous. Yes, yeah, and it also gives them, them an option to identify themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they thought that we wouldn't get very many responses if um, it was in a letter format because of that reason. I, and I should have <laughs> that. that, that <coughs> my questionnaire, some of them were particular to one state, you know, given that your system does this and this and this, is that a good idea or not? And so it was Mary, and I'd forgotten that, uh, who recommended this somewhat longer format as a way of getting more honest answers. <coughs> and this that I should mention too is that, and I will send this out as soon as the meeting is over so everyone has it electronically, but um, it looks like it's longer, but it splits into, if you have an election system, you just go to election questions. So this contains all the questions, but if you have an appointment system, you just go to the appointment questions. Um, and the Survey Monkey estimates it will take less than 10 minutes to complete. So there's no. that to consider too. I have one question, yeah, Chairman. Chief Justice uh, Phillips. As far as the retention ballot, those states that do the retention ballot, what uh, do you know the continuity on the, the continuity of judicial representation after the retention ballot? Well, uh, yes, it's it's something over ninety eight percent of all judges are retained, but that is somewhat less than that at the high at high court. In other words, the where these have become real battles is at the Supreme Court level, and that goes back nearly 40 years when Rose Byrd and, and Cruz Renosa and, well, somebody else, three Supreme Court justices in California were defeated for their votes on the death penalty. And it's happened about half the cycle since then. So I probably about 90%, 95 of Supreme Court justices are retained. It's pretty, it's way high down in the district court range. and. And truly, I think the retention ballot does more good for the judge than really as a check on staying in office. It just reminds the judge who the ultimate boss is and keeps, keeps them from falling into what some people say is federal judgeitis, I mean, if you've got a lifetime mm -hmm. job. Because uh, the judge, there are studies that show that judges work harder and are, not, and are <coughs> on time better in the year leading up to their retention election. Uh, they try more cases. I presume they're nicer to the witnesses and the jurors. I mean, it has that important, I mean, there is an important accountability function to an election and the retention ballot presumably helps with that. Some states have an elevated number. You have to get 57% in New Mexico and Illinois, and I presume a few people get a majority but don't get retained. Well, it, all that could be tinkered with. But it has not been uh, yet, except in Supreme Court races, uh, an invitation for citizens to really carefully scrutinize each of their judges and go sit in the courtrooms and, and cast careful yes-no ballots. <clears throat> Is it possible that we could get a copy of some of those sample ballots, retention ballots? Sure. Uh, we'll do that and we'll have at some point when we get down to this, there are there are studies about retention elections. A guy named from Drake has done a lot of work on that. Larry somebody. Okay, any other questions of uh, former Chief Justice Phillips? All right, if not, uh, call us. So our working group is a title of appointments and confirmations. Um, Senator Huffman, Representative Hunter, Representative Bruce Langreth, uh, Chip Babcock, uh, Babcock are members of the committee. Uh, we met telephonically um, on February 4th and, uh, and discussed our task, which was to study the pros and cons of the various methods for appointing judges, terms of office, and the desirability and nature of legislative confirmation of gubernatorial appointments. Um, we, uh, Chip, um, sent around an email which is very detailed, and uh, we can provide that to the committee, uh, to the commission as well. But uh, he identified some of the problems that we've already discussed. The money uh, in judicial races 
uh, the ignorance of uh, voters, and I don't mean that pejoratively, but just it's hard to get information on judges, especially in urban or in statewide contests, <coughs> and the um, ability of people to assume judicial office who have uh, no experience whatsoever uh, in a courtroom. Uh, no trials, no appeals, um, and just no real wisdom about how a, a trial or appeal is received. Um, so one version uh, that uh, Chip recommended is that the government, the governor appoint uh, judges and uh, have that subject to a vetting process by a commission uh, that would rate the governor's uh, appointees uh, in terms of qualified or not qualified. Um, I think everyone on the phone call was in favor of Senate confirmation, uh, two-thirds Senate confirmation. In, ter in terms of terms of office, uh, Chip uh, suggested for the high court, 10 years, for courts of appeals, eight, and for district courts, six. Um, and the appointed judge would serve and then be subject to a retention election. Uh, this system would be designed to have less money in uh, in these races, more public confidence in the judicial <coughs> process, and it helps the problem of uninformed voters by uh, looking at merit at, at the initial stage, and it would eliminate the partisan sweeps that we see. So the retention election would be nonpartisan. Um, I made a proposal that is also merit selection. Can I just add one thing? There was a component of my proposal uh, which is sort of vague, but it said we need to be uh, attuned to and protect the incumbent judges who were just elected uh, in the last election. You know, we, in my view, we can't uh, just uh, run over the, the will of our electorate uh, that, that did sweep a lot of people out of office, uh, but we need to have some protection for them. We can't just say, okay, you know, you had an election, fine, now you're gone. You got to we got to protect them in some way. Sorry, Walsh. No, and, I, and I'd like to invite the working group to, to weigh in um, you know, at the conclusion because I may have missed some uh, aspects. But the, uh, so Chip's uh, suggestion was gubernatorial appointment and then a vetting by the commission. I would flip that and I would have the commission provide a list to the governor um, after a full and transparent process. So are we on, um, uh, are, is this being broadcast? Yes. So it would be like this, you know, so you would have a chair of the commission and every candidate that comes before the commission uh, is subject to uh, whoever wants to see the process working. Uh, so they would, they would see the qualifications, they would see the debate among the commissioners and the ultimate selection uh, of the list. And then the governor would select from that list. Uh, and I agree that it should be subject to a two thirds uh, Senate confirmation. Now, the question and the real um, nitty-gritty here is who is the commission? Uh, because in some states, commissions are taken over by interest groups. And, um, and, and so you worry about that. My own, this is not, I've not you know, put this down in writing yet, but I would have a commission uh, in which the governor has the most appointees. Um, uh, this is to, to the commission. To the commission, right. The governor has the most appointees to the commission because the governor is the governor and, and has always um, been instrumental in uh, is like him appointing judges in terms of vacancies. I would have uh, commissions uh, members selected by the lieutenant governor and the speaker as well, and also by the senior member of the opposite party in power in the legislature. So the senior uh, member of the uh, House of Representatives and um, the dean of the Senate, uh, and currently would be Democrat. Uh, somebody from the state bar, probably a county judge association representation. Um, and I would have a majority of the members be non-lawyers, actually, not public, not lawyers, but so that you have a public input and you kind of take away this sort of um, industry practice of, of uh, you know, the, the elite lawyers choosing. And then I would also have a retention election. The, the idea about retention election, though, would, um, would be to have a evaluation of the judges in office. So after they've served a term, uh, the maybe the same commission would uh, put out uh, their rating of the judge and their recommendation whether to keep the judge or to not retain the judge, and that would go to the voters. So they would have more information as they're walking into the ballot box about whether um, uh, to retain the judge or not. An alternative to this whole system, um, and, and, 
that would keep the current system in place because we didn't make a determination you know of, about you know the, the fundamental work of this commission what recommendations to make one alternative would be, be to enhance judicial qualifications uh, right now uh, in Texas the qualifications are extraordinarily minimal uh, you have to have so many years as a district or, or <coughs> judge to be qualified to run a member in good standing of the state bar and a certain minimum age and that's it so you have no idea whether the person you're electing uh, knows how to try a case or argue an appeal or is a hard worker or any of that and so can you enhance the qualifications uh, one idea to do that would be to tie it to board certification you know if you're board certified in an area of law you've had peer review you've had a minimum number of uh, trials or appeals or you know minimum experience and um, and you're, you're vetted by judges and, and your, your, your peers uh, but there are you know we so when I've mentioned that there is a question that arose well how, how do other states do this you know are there some states that have qualifications and the answer basically is no uh, the answer is uh, all the states have minimum years and uh, some will, will qualify it being you know a person high standing in the profession but there are no objective measures um, a commission uh, would be vetting all these without the need for these sorts of qualifications but if you have um, uh, the same system we have now um, then you know the certification would be some measure of merit there are problems with this uh, there are cons to a qualification you know requirement uh, not all certified lawyers make good judges uh, even lawyers who've had a lot of experience shouldn't be on the bench uh, you know for various reasons um, and it's hard to get uh, the approval of rural counties uh, if you insist on the sort of elite judge uh, that you want to put on the bench uh, that perhaps lacks the common touch so there are pros and cons of, of each of these uh, we also looked at whether uh, our task as a commission as a whole commission is to make sweeping changes or to look at small steps um, and uh, I think David made the point he was also on the, on the call that uh, our work is uh, has been defined by the legislative uh, directive uh, in creating this commission and so we're uh, we're you know we we think that we're, we're trying to propose what is best for the public um, and, and if it's sweeping that's the that's the way we would go um, the status quo uh, is not all bad I think I mentioned this last time I mean one thing uh, Tom mentioned is if you are subject to a vote uh, you have to get out among you know the voters and explain what the judges do and what you bring to the bench um, and you uh, it's a civics education that's the way I took these elections anyway you go speak of a rotary club and you do a survey and no one the very few would know that they elect their judges um, uh, but you could start saying well why is it important that you know who they are and, and what kinds of cases are heard and, and when does a judge um, override a legislative uh, statute you know I mean that's a very serious thing and, and there's separation of powers and you, you know you, you, you bring you know the, the voters along uh, to understand and you've got editorial boards uh, where you know sophisticated uh, people can really evaluate your um, your qualifications and then you know uh, go to the uh, to the uh, pr uh, proposed voters and say here here's who we recommend up or down um, so there are advantages and also you as a judicial candidate especially on the Supreme Court I think um, uh, but everywhere you go out and you hear where there are problems in the, in the system um, one reason we have electronic filing in Texas t today is because <coughs> Jefferson County many many years ago um, uh, started doing you know electronic filing uh, this is back in the like early 90s and, the, and it, it was a test case and you could see where it worked and where it didn't work and, and you bring the good and, and get rid of the bad and, and you have a <coughs> electronic filing system um, as a result so there are there are advantages and I think we shouldn't lose sight of that uh, but in the end the idea of accountability for uh, voters who have no idea who who the judges are on the ballot um, uh, is I, I, I see it as a problem and the fact that money uh, drives who is able to uh, get elected and retain their elections undermines confidence that you know that the judicial decisions aren't the subject of um, purchase um, uh, through that system
And I think that's enough. I'll open it up to other members of the working group. If you have I have a question. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. You know, you know uh, two quick uh, observations. Uh, one uh, is um, on the qualifications part. Uh, for me, uh, it's important to have objective qualifications uh, because you have some judges who, are quite frankly, are very qualified. Uh, and I try to eliminate this objective for the simple reason that they may not have uh, good court manners, but they are very good judges. If other judges have great court manners, but are not that good, so I mean, I try to get through to that uh, part of selecting the judges, uh, to me, is very important. Objective qualification minimizes subjective uh, qualifications. Uh, the other one is, um, uh, I, I like the suggestion of having a, um, a commission, if you will, um, vet uh, different candidates and then make the recommendation to the governor two or three, top three, whatever they recommend. Uh, the appointment process, what we have seen at the federal level, is very politicized. And trying to find ways to minimize the politics. I mean, you, you never eliminate them 100%, uh, but I think you can minimize the politics to the point you get a better quality uh, product, if you will, uh, in terms of the, the, the uh, judiciary. Uh, and, and you're right about protecting the integrity uh, of uh, our judicial system because we have a lot of um, litigants and not, not from Texas, they're, they're from New York, you know, they're from Pennsylvania uh, or from other parts of the country. Uh, and we don't want certainly to put them to get the, to the perception uh, that we will have a very biased system either way. Right. Good point. Good. Senator Bergman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good to see you again, Justice. Good to see you. Uh, you were the first person to swear me in. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> to swearing in as opposed to swearing in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, much that you much that you said, and I hope we'll see a, a, some summation. Uh, so my, my apologies for the expectation of a, of, a, of a written document, but there were two things that you mentioned. You mentioned board certified. Are boards of certification a governmental body or are they a private association? So there's a um, Texas Board of Legal Specialization, which was formed in the late 1980s. Um, is it a... Uh, well, it, it's state bar. It's under the umbrella of the state bar. So it's affiliated with the state bar. A state agency. Quite Almost. Yeah. Well, but it's not governed by the state bar. I think that may be important <laughs> to the question. Yes, it has its own independent director and, and members of the okay. certification. So, so the point about the court. So here, the follow-up to that was because when you hear the word independent, the, the question always comes, what, independent of what? Or independent <laughs> of whom? Who are they independent of? So the, the, the board certification, they are objective uh, standards before you can even, you're, you're, sub, you're eligible to sit for an examination and you take a written examination um, and those the exams are graded and, you know, the, there's a, a calling. You know, if you haven't studied the rules of procedure, then you're not going to be, become board certified in civil appellate, you know, that sort of thing. So, so like in, in our larger counties, our, our courts specialize. You know, family court, criminal court, civil court, uh, juvenile courts. Um, it is is that the kind of board certification you're looking for? Because um, I know there's all kinds of attorney. You know, there's environmental law. There's a, so, so is it by type of court? Because like in, in in my home county, I've got a general. You know, I've got one district court for my county, and it's got general jurisdiction. For everything, the bigger city. I mean, you know, you know all this as as a chief. So I'm trying to figure out what that stamp of approval would look like, and by whom, <clears throat> and the interests of whom is making the stamp on somebody concerned the great. So I, I wouldn't do. I wouldn't personally do it per court, but we didn't get involved in, in the details here. But it is a proxy. You know, if you're board certified in any area, um, in, in real estate law or in criminal law, you have a, a certain standard that you've met uh, where you have, your peers say that you should be, uh, you know, certified as an expert. Uh, the, the judges are also asked about these qualifications. You pass an exam. That distinguish, distinguishes a person who is appointed from a certified um, board member from the person who, uh, who puts his name on the ballot or her name on the ballot who has no uh, 
court experience, no legal experience to speak of whatsoever, and has never been uh, vetted by peers. And, so, and so that's more the dividing line. Okay. So that the uh, again, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your your difference. So of the population of people that are authorized to practice law, is that a 20% calling, a 30%, I mean, is it half the people are board certified, the other half attorneys are not? Yeah, is it, is, is it, have we gone from, we've only called 10% of the, of the attorneys that, uh, with that certification? I think board certification would be 10% or less of the attorney population would be my, okay. my guess. And one of your other elements of your, your report, you mentioned for terms. Uh, I think you said a district judge for, for, Four years, appellate judge six. Six, eight, ten. Six, eight, ten, okay. And, 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 and there's that, another proposal for uh, longer terms, um, eight, ten, twelve. Was, it, was that term given in the, in the context of a term limit? No. So that would be the, the initial term um, uh, pending a retention. A retention or appointment or, or something so right. so the opportunity for the people of Texas to weigh in on the performance of anybody on a statewide court would be a decade the opportunity to weigh in on an appellate judge would be uh, two presidential a pres potentially a president's two terms uh, and then on a district court similar to our US senators once every six years thank you sir Thank you, yeah, sure. Just to follow up, I mean, to be clear on, on board specialization, am I not correct that, that you have specific areas of specialization, like civil trial practice, appellate practice, real estate, so that even though you're board certified in one category, doesn't mean you're board certified in everything. That's correct. Yes. But, but, but what I was getting at, though, Mr. Chairman, was because I, I don't know what the total group of board certified would be, so I think you. So it's not whether you have multiple, but it's how many attorneys out there or how many people with a law degree that meet the minimum standards are board certified. It would, it would as a novice to board certification, mm -hmm. I would think that a preponderance of the attorneys out there are, based on your answer, it's very yeah. minimal. Uh, I, I, what, what, what are the things, uh, well, well, is that if you set a, a qualification of having, being board certified, uh, it will push more attorneys who want to be in the judiciary to certify themselves and, and do the studies that are necessary for them to meet the standards that are set by the state bar uh, and, and which is supported by uh, other lawyers uh, mm -hmm. as to what should be, what, what, what course you make in the test, what are the standards, what are the minimum requirements. I think it would push lawyers who want to be judges to do that. Uh, so I, I, it would be a positive step in, in increasing the pool, if you will, because you have to be a, a an attorney to be a judge in, in most cases besides JP Court, I think. Mr. Moore. Question, uh, Chief. In our under our current system, do, do you happen to know what percentage of our judges are in fact appointed today? I, I don't know the percentage. It's large. I think it's in the high thirties. Megan, Megan has it. Yeah. But you can just look at like the Supreme Court of Texas, for example. Right. You look through and most were got there initially by appointment, um, and, uh, and and I think that's true. You know, anytime there's a vacancy, the governor has the opportunity to make an appointment. Yeah. So uh, I guess under our right. current system today, de facto, most of our judges, and I think Megan's going to give us the percentage in a minute, are in fact appointed already, and then they have to run for election. Okay. And then the, 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 another question I had is. When Chief Justice Phillips was talking, we were talking about expenses. If you go appointment retention, the judge is going to have to run a retention election, which will obviously necessitate some expense. So could you address that issue? Yes, I, I, if I can take it first, I'm glad you asked that question at kind of a broader level. So um, let's say in California or more recently in Iowa, you know, where, where judges are retained, uh, subject to retention elections. In Iowa, they made a ruling on same-sex marriage that the public didn't like, you know, at least surveys said. Um, and so a lot of money came in that campaign to not retain those judges. 
but a lot of that money was not had nothing to do with um, the uh, same-sex marriage issue, but was tort reform based. You know, are they for trial lawyers or business? Lawyers? But they used that as the clutch, you know, to get rid of judges that, that, that they were not happy with. The, the, what I think is a, a, a favorable part of this retention election after merit selection system is, yeah, you can pour that money in, but those money interests cannot then replace that judge with somebody that they like. You have to go back through this merit selection system where the, uh, each you know potential judge is evaluated based on objective measures and their experience and their you know education and peer review and that sort of thing. Um, so the money can be spent, but but I think, and maybe Megan, this is some something that we can find out that in retention election states, the amount of dollars spent on a judicial race is far less. I mean, like like <coughs> pennies on the dollar of uh, cases in states where the, there are partisan elections, where the money floods in uh, because industry groups want their person to represent them, you know, in court and. Um, and, and so I, I, I think the, a retention election system would remove um, the, the, the inappropriate, in my view, um, uh, surge of money in judicial races. Chief Justice Phillips? Um, I suspect, Wallace, you've made a careful study of this because you, you are on one of the major groups that that looks at how to make merit selection systems better. That's the IAALS, and you've been on, uh, you're also on the federal screening committee uh, for we both judges in Texas. Uh, I'm worried about uh, the, the trade-off between every judicial applicant who at least somebody thinks is serious enough to merit performance. Are you talking about the appointment? The, the, the appointment. initial appointment. Okay. Being on, you know, some type of TV or internet where you can see who they are uh, versus the uh, the ability to apply without the world knowing you're applying to be a judge and that leads to less transparency and accountability and it's quite a trade-off. If, if, You've said this publicly, so I guess I'm not giving anything away. You were not sitting in your office thinking, boy, I'd sure like to be on the Supreme Court of Texas. I'm going to do whatever I can do to get there. I mean, you were picked by the governor from among 100,000 lawyers in the state. This person ought to be uh, on the court, and you serve with great distinction. And the federal system, you can apply and you can tell all your friends if you want to, but it doesn't have to get out. So in other words, you don't have to send some of your clients to say, please keep sending me business, but I might not be around. I have one chance in nine of getting uh, appointed and confirmed to a federal bench. And I just wonder what it's going to do to candidate recruitment and where's the right place of the trade-off. Because being in practice these days, if you're in any kind of private practice, it's a marketing business. and looking like you may not be around to provide the service is a bad <coughs> marketing tool. I think Megan has a percentage on the appointments. Yeah, so of, of current judges, 78% um, 78 78 of the Supreme Court uh, judges assumed office by appointment, 36% of courts of appeals judges, and 27% of district judges of sitting judges. It's dropped dramatically. In yeah, the is that true the last November 18, 2018 is, election? It, yes, okay. and this is as of so September 1st, 2019. It, it would account for the, for the sweep, if you will. Okay. So, um, I think Arizona addressed the concern or, or the, the, uh, the issue that Chief Justice Phillips raised, and that is, if everything is transparent, does that uh, decrease the pool of uh, people who will apply? You know, because Let's say you're at a you're you're at a top firm, um, and the firm wants you to be a partner forever, and and you're applying to be on the on the Supreme Court or on the field district court. Now they know, and will that deter that person from applying? The answer is probably on the margins, yes. Uh, but we have so many uh, very qualified lawyers who want to be judges who today are not doing it because they know if I if I put my name in the hat for a judge, either appointment, and I get it, or I'm elected, I could be swept out in the very next election. So I've given up my practice, 
you know, 30 years um, of all my clients, and I, and I had four years on the district bench, and then that year, it's Obama or McCain, you know, and they, they elect McCain, and so they lose. And the next year is Trump, and they win. You know, you, so you lose the, the, the sort of control of your own destiny, and, um, uh, and not because you're a bad judge, but because of political considerations, or your name is not appealing to the voters, or somebody spends more money than you uh, during the campaign. Um, I think the, the, the value in an appointment system that is transparent so the public can see everything, it, you, you don't, you, uh, is, is that you, you have a little bit more security in office. And I'll say this one thing about uh, appointments um, in a system where the governor makes the appointment, uh, and I saw this firsthand uh, on the Supreme, when I was on the Supreme Court, when there's a vacancy, um, uh, a judge retired or was elevated to the Fifth Circuit or you know went or went to the federal district bench. When there's a vacancy, I got calls from um, from all kinds of and, and saw that the governor also got calls from all kinds of interest groups. So the doctors want somebody, or the trial lawyers want this person, or um, the automobile industry, you know, and all of that is going mm -hmm. on behind closed doors. There's no. Uh, the public doesn't see that at all. It's a smoke <coughs> room or whatever you want to call it, um, where I think a little light of day would make that process better um, and, and, uh, and tend to promote uh, judges who don't have uh, an agenda uh, necessarily, but have the qualifications uh, that everybody can agree on. And the commission, if it's bipartisan, and it is public, uh, public members, and a lot of non-lawyers, and you really think about its composition, uh, they, you know, that sort of input uh, is going to, I think, have a tendency to eliminate the extremes uh, on the margin. It's not too far right or left politically, uh, or not too far pro-business or pro-personal you know, um, personal injury you know, uh, lawyer, uh, but a more measured and qualified and, and studious. Uh, yeah, and, and one of the comments uh, to the Jefferson you made, I think is very important, it is that, it, quite frankly, I think it would increase the pool of candidates. Because they don't have to worry about having those extreme swing elections, depending on who's on top of the ticket. Uh, so they don't have to shut down uh, their law practice and be back and try to build up a clientele in four years. I will say, that, and David, I think you'll agree with this, uh, I think all the lawyers will. Um, the, the, as a lawyer, the, uh, when you walk into a courtroom and you see the judge, um, you know that, you know, you, you, or you've got an intelligence on the judge. Um, the judge that is um, thoughtful, and you don't know necessarily which way they're going to come out, uh, that studies the, the issues, you know, that you're trying to get the piece of evidence in, and they explain why it's, the, the, they're, you, it's admitted or excluded. Um, uh, that's the kind of judge you want. And you don't think in your mind, oh, this is a Republican judge or, or Democrat. Uh, if it's a good judge, you're a little scared, actually. I mean, you're, you, you have to be better at what you do to, to persuade that judge that you're right. Um, and I, I just think that's what we want. And, and the, the lawyers, most lawyers know who they are. And, and county to county, you know, when, the, when these sweeps happen, I'll just give you one example, and I, I'm talking too much, but one example. Um, where a Republican was swept out in Harris County in 2008. Uh, and that judge presided over a huge um, uh, piece of litigation. Um, and the Democrat was swept in. The parties from both sides asked me to make an appointment uh, to keep that judge in that case. Uh, and this is Democrats and Republicans asking the judge to remain because of the judge's wisdom and experience and qualifications for that, that's the kind of judge uh, that ultimately we, we want serving uh, the people of Texas. Yeah, and as I said at our first meeting, I've tried cases before Democrat judges, Republican judges. It doesn't matter to me. All I want is a judge who's going to follow the law and call balls and strikes for my client. And I think that as long as a judge will do that, then I think it, it serves our system and it certainly serves the people of Texas. Representative Sherman, you had a question. Yes, Chairman Beck, uh, Chief uh, Jefferson. As it relates to the enhanced judicial qualifications, is it your opinion that that should apply to uh, appointments as well? If we have it, yes, I think it, it would. It would apply to appointments and to... 
And you also express concern regarding the rural jurisdictions that maybe the enhanced judicial qualifications may be a little bit more difficult to find viable candidates. Is that so, it's, so in part, yes, uh, because you have in a Harris County, you, you know, there are hundred thousand, well, tens of thousands of lawyers, and, and many of them are board certified. So that is one um, issue. And you can think about uh, whether a system would have qualifications uh, for you know that sort of district uh, as opposed to rural. But the point I think our working group was also making is um, just because a judge. Um, or a lawyer graduated from Harvard, for example, doesn't mean that judge is going to be very good on the bench. Um, and just because a judge uh, can pass an exam doesn't mean they're going to be the, the most hardworking and uh, fair you know, judge on the bench. And so it, that's why I say, it's a, it, for me, it's a proxy. You know, at least it, it, it has a minimal level of qualifications. You know that this judge is a serious candidate, but it's not, you know, none of these systems are perfect, and, and it doesn't mean uh, either in a rural, rural or an urban county that that is the, uh, uh, you know, the only test for a good judge. And we're, we're not like the European system. You know, in, in Europe, you, you decide early on uh, you, when you're in school, in law school, that you want to be a judge, and then you're on the course. Uh, to be a judge and and you're you go through all these tests to to qualify you know we don't have that sort of system we have one where it's open to the to the entire bar and so the question is how do you um, sort of uh, put in place uh, some kind of system where the judge who's I mean, presiding over life and death you know the death penalty case or the removal of children from parents you know or, or a, a multi-billion dollar piece of litigation how do you uh, make sure that that judge has the intellect, uh, the compassion, yes, the qualifications, the work ethic uh, to handle that uh, that case uh, the way that we expect our judges to do so. And uh, one way would be to think about you know some kind of um, uh, either uh, in our current system for certification or, or other you know minimum number of trials or appeals or in uh, a merit selection system, a commission that really looks at those objective standards before making a recommendation to the governor. Okay. Tom? Just a question to you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in Texas, every judge is equal. I mean, you get your certificate and you, as a district judge, give preference to certain kind of work in some counties, but you have jurisdiction to try anything. and. Most, if not all, our major counties, there's just a random distribution of cases, and it land, the billion dollar case lands in your court, it's you. Uh, and there's some merit in that, and the, the voters better pay attention to who their <laughs> judges are. But in many states, and perhaps most, the administrative judges are far more powerful. And, you know, they take who they've got. Here's our judges, but you get assigned to a docket, and somebody might just happen to always be assigned to traffic court every time, or uh, other people might get assigned to the big business courts. It's a whole other system of a way of looking at the, the pool of who you have to work with. And I don't know if that's beyond our scope or not. I'll tell you, it has its own set of uh, entrenched enemies to that kind of change. And you've got to make certain your administrative judges, yeah. they become real important. I don't but, see that as within our legislative mandate, but that doesn't mean we can't address it. Uh, is, there, uh, is the question administrative judges or the 11 regional presiding administrative well, justices? Well, we, you know, it can be done either way. Uh, it's in most places. I, I don't know that many states, they're not spread out as Texas. I think this administrative regional thing may be unique to us. It's generally within, within you know, an urban county will be its own administrative region, and a judge who gets there somehow, generally by election by the other judges, but not always. I mean, that's how we have it in Texas. Our big urban county, you know, well, every place that has three judges or more elects an administrative judge, and they're elected every two years by the judges themselves. And that's, that was the nature of my question, was it that, like I've got three district courts in Ellis County, the senior so judge, Judge Carroll, is the administrator within that, that county. That's who I'm thinking But it's of. in the, the Dallas regional presiding administrative right. judge that's multi-county. I was thinking of your judge in Ellis, given 
that judge more power to say when the new judge comes in who doesn't know anything uh, we're going to limit you to cases where somebody wants two hundred dollars and if they want more you have to kick it over to the uh, one of the other two it's just it that is a whole other way of looking at things in terms of dealing with the vast disparity that every state has i suspect between the very best the judge is most confident to handle really complex stuff or who have expertise in a certain area and know about it. And if it's beyond our scope, I guess I'm grateful. Um, <laughs> I've been observing all this. <laughs> Remember our goal is making sure that Texans are protected and getting rid of justice for sale and these are two very serious topics one clarification that i raised is when we talk about appointments and confirmations one way to make sure citizens are involved whether it's a selection system or an election system is remember that texas all different areas of the state and they're if you're going to look at confirmations or appointments sometimes it's not the biggest sell to tell my area of the state that you're going to appoint somebody from another area of the state the best education not board certification not school is knowing your people to me the best judge knows the community selection or election so when we talk on this issue of appointments and confirmation, I reiterate, don't try to take a urban metropolitan million plus zone and apply that type of judge to an area that may have 100,000 population. I think Brooks, you and I raised this on the phone. That is the best education for communities and for judges is knowing and being involved in areas of the state that they know. And that helps a big learning curve. There's a lot of issues in my area that you only watch on television, but my people live in it. And so when we talk about confirmations and appointments, uh, <coughs> let's take that factor in. I think there's still a little bit of a I think Senator Hanahosa, you'd agree with me that sometimes the assignment of judges we kind of question in certain areas of the state. And we don't want to go to that source. So I want to put a little bit of input into, I think, your and my comment from the West Texas and the South Texas. We don't want to lose the communities of interest in the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And just to follow up, I guess on the board certification, uh, board, uh, imposing a board certification requirement, I, I googled to see how many board certified attorneys were. I, I figured it was between five and ten percent. I think it's seventy four hundred out of over a hundred thousand lawyers. But I think if you break it down even further, there, there's like fifteen areas you can get board certified in. And I'd be curious how many of them are board certified in tax law or, or, or real estate law, which is seldom litigated as opposed to how many of them are civil trial, civil appellate, and personal injury. And, and so, and, and, and also to make another point, uh, Senator, uh, there are a lot of attorneys like myself that I've tried over 100 cases, I'm not board certified. I, I, I said, after I took the bar exam, I'll be damned, am I gonna take another exam in my life? <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and so I wanna make that point. So I, I like the idea of, of having minimum qualifications. I think we could take the qualifications that you need to get board certified in civil trial law and maybe impose that on judges. You know, you, you've had at least, what is it, 25 trials for the, to become it's 14, 15, 50, 50 yeah, it's, good. It's, good. It's, it's somewhere between 15 and 20. And, and, and I think you can impose some of those same requirements, uh, uh, you know, on, on judicial candidates. So that way you know you're getting somebody you know that's, that's been in a courtroom. And, uh, but yeah, I did, did want to make that point because when you talk about board certification, <laughs> it, it, it's a small point. Because kind of with what, Chief at the Chief Phillips at the end, it, there may be a level of, of too granular, uh, too detailed, maybe too micromanaging that uh, that we don't want to broach. Uh, 
I think your comments are well received and well taken. Chip? Yes, uh, following up on Representative Hunter's statement, um, is it your thought that <clears throat> if there is going to be uh, uh, ultimately an appointment, whether it's before or after a commission, that for district judges, the appointee should come from the county, or court of appeals should come from the multi-county area that that is covered by the court of appeals, and then for the for the Supreme Court, anybody in the <coughs> in the state. I think there needs to be a community element yeah. in there, because uh, I know you practice an area. And Brooks is like me, where you have rolling county judges for four counties. Right. And then you may have, in my area, the county courts of law that have unlimited jurisdiction versus most that don't have unlimited jurisdiction. So the I think statewide on a Supreme Court, that's a different level. Courts of appeals, I think, is more regional, like you're saying. I just don't want us to lose the local element because everybody's saying here, let's educate, make sure people are involved. The best way to make sure folks are involved is making sure there's a community pool, uh, if you have it, if you have it. Let me make another comment since you brought that up. I'm struggling on the minimum because if you're going to get appointed, how much is it civil versus criminal? I may not get 25 criminal trials. I may not want 25 criminal trials. <laughs> Family law. Is that all I end up getting? So I think we have to look at that's more detailed on the qualifications on what <coughs> lawyers practicing. Brooks may have a docket of oil and gas, but I also think the element that you bring up of economics is very, very important. Both of you. Yes, sir. Yeah, I my own thought is that uh, we're we're traveling down two different tracks. Uh, if we go to a uh, appointment commission, commission appointment, whatever that track is, uh, elevating the the qualifications, which would require, in, in many instances, amending the constitution, uh, that's less important because you would hope that the governor and the commission wouldn't appoint. Uh, people that did, weren't, they didn't feel were qualified. Uh, if, however, we, we don't do that and we stay with the current system of straight elections, be they partisan or nonpartisan, then the qualifications might be more relevant. Uh, but uh, with respect to this, um, you know, getting certified, like David, I've tried over 100 cases and I'm not certified. Uh, and I worry about uh, barriers to entry, uh, you know, it costs money to do that. Not only it costs money, you have to pay the certification commission, but it takes time. And some people don't have as much time and money as others. And we don't want to erect some sort of barrier like that where particular people are excluded uh, from the ability to become judges because of that. Well, so frankly, some of my colleagues have reported that the reason they became board certified was it was a marketing um, gimmick. Not a gimmick, but, but a, a marketing effect. Uh, it allowed them in their advertising to say, you know, I am board specialized in whatever area it was. Uh, and I think that's probably why we have such a relatively small percentage that are board certified. But if you're not board certified, that doesn't mean you're not a really good lawyer. Yes, Chief Phillip. Well, I think some good points have been made here, and there's two different, in terms of using some other test or standard as a qualification for uh, office or as a qualification for the ballot, the specialization exam could be given for free to anybody who asks for it. And, you know, a judicial candidate could perhaps qualify by meeting the board certification standards, a certain number of trials, uh, a certain number of years of experience, or by sitting for the test and showing the, the knowledge capacity. I mean, there's, there's, there are ways you could use these standards and play with them. Uh, if that is going to be a qualification for office, there has to be a constitutional amendment. I think that's a more likely constitutional amendment to be in favor with the voters than some others, that is, elevating the qualification. But it can also be a qualification for ballot like the petition signatures. Uh, and that doesn't require, that requires a statute. 
<laughs> so, in other words, I mean, one, I'll just say it, uh, uh, one of the new judges in Dallas suggested this to me, and it's, it's quite brilliant, to, to qualify for, to file a treasurer designation, you have to say you've sat for a specialization exam, which they have to give you for free. But you don't have to say if you pass it or not. <laughs> and then if you decide to, you get your score back, and if you decide to file for office, your score is released on the internet at the time you pay your filing fee. If you file your treasurer, if you don't pass, if you get your score back and you don't like it, or you don't want it made public, you just kind of go, you know, on about your business. Uh, and that ostensibly would not require anything other than a change in the law. Uh, so there, there are ways to think about uh, qualifications in terms of what we're doing on ballot access or even on the other end if you don't take 15, 16 hours a year of judicial education the conduct can <coughs> throw you out so you can so there's two very different things here but i like the idea of you have to sit for the test because you can you can flunk the test you can make a zero on that test and still run <laughs> it's just that's out there in the public but any other questions of uh, Chief Justice Jefferson? Just, yes, just one more. Uh, as it relates to the test qualification and then making it public, uh, my only concern with that is that since the uh, elections are partisan by nature, it doesn't seem to matter to the electorate of what the qualifications are. They're going to vote Republican or they're going to vote <coughs> Democrat. The enhanced judicial qualifications, though, though I understand your argument, Senator Birdwell, in regards to keeping it open for those individuals that have a desire to serve, uh, I don't know of any other way to actually qualify individuals uh, before they're even uh, considered uh, to be candidates because the public trusts us uh, to establish some standards and invariably after these elections if it's a democratic sweep <coughs> a democrat sweep or a republican sweep then people question the competency of the bench uh, and as if our views are translucent you know i mean we're we're all partisan by nature some bias that we have so I don't know whether enhancing the qualifications uh, helps or, or doesn't help, but it seems to me that it would provide some uh, increased standards, raising the bar. Five to seven percent, I think, is what you said in regards to those who have that certification. I mean, is that so bad that we want our judges to, you know, go a little further on qualifications. I, I don't know. I think you make an excellent point because we're nobody has a lifetime entitlement to one of these jobs that you would like to you would like to think if you've done a good job you have a better chance of keeping it as long as you want it and you can qualify for your pension, which is as the legislators know is is a good thing. Uh, but if, a, if people want to vote you out because we want a partisan judge and you have a label on there, I, that's fine if you're, for the public, if you're replaced by somebody else who's competent, uh, this, we don't, the system does not suffer. Yeah. As long as we can recruit good candidates. Okay, any other questions of uh, Chief Justice Jefferson? But right, if not, uh, Lynn, you're on. All right. Well, we have a nice advantage of uh, there's several things that we've already talked about uh, that fit into the things that our study group is, is uh, uh, studying. Uh, uh, let me mention that uh, our wonderful group includes Senator Birdwell, Representative Sherman, uh, David Oliveria, and because you want to keep an eye on us, I suppose David Peck. <laughs> so, uh, thank you to all of them. Uh, as has been mentioned before, uh, we did put together, um, uh, and I did with considerable help from Megan and, and the materials that we already have, uh, an outline of the two issues that we're, we're uh, studying. And number one is the qualifications of judges. That may sound familiar. 
uh, and then second, the use <coughs> of uh, citizen commissions. So those are the two areas which clearly overlap and much of, uh, of, of our discussion would have already been had uh, on that. Um, we have some similarities to Chief Justice Phillips' report in that we are uh, issue spots. Uh, we don't make any kind of recommendation. Uh, we have not talked by phone, some individually back and forth and exchanging emails. Uh, and and if, if they're so directed, I'm sure uh, that that will come. But it's really issue spotting uh, that the memo addresses uh, and also uh, that we'll talk about for a few minutes here. The other thing I, I really appreciate, David's uh, willingness to take part in the discussion. I thought it would make it a little bit more interesting and interactive. Uh, and uh, I'm an appellate lawyer, he's the trial lawyer, and we bring a little bit different perspective. So I'm going to start with uh, qualifications. And what I'd like to do is just put some meat on the bones of some of the things we've already talked about, not in great detail at all. Uh, but to give you some more background and to refer to you the, to the memo that, uh, that you got. Uh, and uh, maybe may I'll make a short introduction and then turn it over to David. Uh, he'll talk about the pluses and the minuses. Um, more meat on the bones, right, David, of, uh, of citizen panels. And then, you know, it's a Pandora's box in some ways. Once you get to, oh, we're going to do citizens' panels, let's just assume that we're a decision. That only it opens up a whole bunch of new questions. Uh, related to how those uh, citizen panels would be selected and so forth. So <clears throat> let me backtrack then and, and on qualifications, I thought it might be helpful just to be real specific about what the qualifications are now and where they come from. For uh, appellate judges, the current qualifications is that they be a, a judge or a practicing lawyer. Uh, actually, I'm not sure it even says practicing, a lawyer. Uh, for 10 years at the time of election and be 35 years old. Uh, both of those qualifications are in the Constitution. For uh, district judges, uh, they must have been a judge or lawyer for four years, and that's in the Constitution, and then they must be at least 25 years old, and that's in the government code, so it's statutory. Uh, then the county court at law, probate judges, uh, those are in the statute too, and they mirror the district judges, so must be 25 years old and a practicing lawyer or judge. I think it would almost have to be a lawyer uh, for four years. Uh, as y'all well know, this isn't the first run uh, at doing this, and let me give you just a quick update on, on recent uh, efforts in Texas with no understanding of huge uh, uh, expertise in this. Um, there was a task force uh, of the Texas Commission on Judicial Efficiency created by the legislature in 1995, uh, and it recommended uh, an increase for trial judges from four to eight years um, uh, of, exper of experience uh, before they would be qualified. Uh, and you'll hear that again and again. Um, Judge, uh, I mean, excuse me, uh, Representative Landgraf, I think you were a sponsor, forgive me if I, I got that wrong, of the other uh, recent, uh, to 2008, uh, Texas Judicial Committee recommendation. One, no, I apologize, that's not right. That, I'm on the next one. I, I've got that wrong. Start, start that. Uh, on the, uh, we'll get to that in a minute. But uh, there was a, a, a Texas Judicial Committee created by the Civil Justice Council who issued a report in 2018, uh, very similar, uh, recommended raising uh, the age uh, for statutory county courts and probate courts from um, 25 to 30 years old, and let's see, um, uh, increasing the number of years for uh, appellate judges to 12 years and to district judges for eight years. So. Uh, there seems to be, and I think this will come up over and over again, a relative comfort level with increasing um, the number of years of practice uh, and probably uh, the age. Um, in any of uh, uh, the discussions in all of these uh, reports that we've received and other materials, there's always a discussion very similar to what we have of the more difficult qualifications to quantify. And I won't really go into those other than just to say, you know, that's, that's another area. It's, um, uh, there's not as much material on that, uh, but it's certainly something uh, to consider. I know uh, a 
because we've talked about the board certification issue. Uh, I, I'm not sure that's the answer, but the question by way of example, I know we have a, 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 a very highly thought of judge in Harris County whose opponent uh, is a realtor who has a, a driver, has a uh, law license. And so that's, I think, is an example of the problem looking uh, for a solution. Uh, as far as the possible changes, uh, extend the time for a judge uh, to have been practiced, I mean, a, yeah, a candidate to, uh, or an appointee, uh, the time that they would practice, uh, and their age limits, uh, and then some of the other topics that we've talked about. So I don't want to, like I said, I don't want to reinvent that. The second thing to change course, and, and uh, Representative Landgraf, forgive me, I know this was, uh, uh, you were part of Legislative House Bill 4505, did I get that right? All right, good. Uh, and that related to, uh, part as part of it, the appointment of a Judicial Appointments Advisory Board, what we think is sometimes called a Citizen Commission more generically. Uh, and. Uh, I think there were some really interesting aspects to that, uh, that it would apply only to uh, metropolitan counties uh, and um, that the voters would have chosen this method within uh, that uh, district. Uh, um, and um, it also had requirements uh, for uh, who would appoint, uh, and that would be the board would provide names to the lieutenant governor uh, and Senate Committee Chair of the Committee with Jurisdiction over Gubernatorial Appointments. The board, uh, without going into a lot of details, would be similar to what we've talked about with multiple uh, uh, um, individuals uh, appointing those primarily uh, within the legislature. Uh, the members would have staggered terms and then they would be subject to nonpartisan judicial election. Um, and maybe in a minute we'll ask you if you would to, to address that. Absolutely. All right, Absolutely. that would be great. Uh, and then um, uh, the way that merit selection generally fits in, and you've already heard this, um, is this uh, nominating panel, whether it's before or, excuse me, yeah, the Citizens Commission, <coughs> um, nominating commission, different, it's used by different names. Does it would be used either to in an appointive system to either make appointments to begin with, uh, uh, make recommendations on, on uh, qualifications afterwards. Uh, there are a variety of ways that they're used, but I think it's pretty typically going to be in an appointment system. So with that as a background, David, you want to talk about the pluses and minuses? Thanks, Lynn, and, and I apologize for not responding to your emails on time. I have, I have a uh, mock trial that I have to do tomorrow in a big case, and then I fully intended last night to, to once I got off the plane to go in my remote order room service and uh, get to work on this, and instead I went to dinner, and then I went to the basketball game, too. So, oh, so, I, so, I, so, I, so, I said, I'll, I'll jump, on, I'll jump on it after the basketball game, and then my 40-year-old daughter called me and said, Dad, you promised to help me with my project of evaluating the state of the union address, grading, oh grading President Trump. I couldn't pass up that opportunity, so I did. But, uh, I have read up on this, and, and I think because of the work we did on CJ, I'm familiar with you know, a lot of what I discuss, and that's a pros and cons of these uh, citizens panels, citizens commissions we're talking about. There's 36 states right now that uh, use commissions to appoint uh, uh, appellate, you know, the highest court in their state. There's 25 that use commissions to appoint district court judges. And all those, I mean, and they greatly vary on, on what type of commissions they have. I'm very familiar with Representative Langbath Bill because I testified uh, uh, on its behalf, and, and I think the breakdown of that was the, the House majority would appoint uh, three, the House majority party would, would get three appointments, the minority party would get two, and then in the Senate it's two and two, and then I think the high, uh, the uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court gets one, and then the Chief Justice of the Court, or the Court of Criminal Appeals judge would, would get one also. That's in direct contrast to Minnesota, and I have a good friend who chairs the Minnesota uh, Commission and uh, Jerry Blackwell, he chaired it in the past. And Jerry and I uh, have spoken several times, but I spoke to him this morning. In Minnesota, they have 10 judicial districts and they appoint 
Uh, there's four commission appointments in each district, a total of 40, and then there's nine at large. Uh, uh, and I, I wonder when you tell me there's four, I think it break the tie. Well, those nine at large guys, they, they, they rotate around the state, and so they go to all the interviews. And so that's why you have kind of a panel of five. Uh, I, I like that because, you know, one of the things I'm concerned about, about appointing a statewide board, and you know, one of the con concerns I've seen raised is that uh, some of those folks on the statewide board are not going to know people in different regions of the state. And, though, you know, although you, we're going to strive for a representative commission and we're going to strive for, you know, to make sure we get, you know, a, a ge good geographical representation, I, I, I like the idea, like Minnesota's idea, where they made it more regional, and that way, you know, people in that area of the state know. I was surprised to learn because, uh, and I'll get into this in the pros and cons, but uh, in Minnesota, half the appointments are, are, are non-lawyers. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's not the case in, in, in other states. But uh, I think some of the advantages, you know, the biggest advantage of citizen panels is that I think the one that's most often talked about is, is you know, removal of partisan politics uh, from the selection of judges. You no know, longer have to run, you know, a particular party. Uh, the judges are selected by commissions uh, that tend to be more independent. I mean, if you, if you really you work hard to appoint an, an independent commission, I think, you know, you, you get somebody that is independent just going to be looking at the best candidates. Uh, it eliminates campaign funding. I mean, that, that's, I can tell you, for, for practicing lawyers, that's uh, one of the biggest nightmares. I, you know, particularly uh, in our area of the state where we're growing a lot, we get new judges, you know, uh, or new courts created every year in Saturday, you know, so, I mean, you know, we went from, you know, back when I first started practicing to have to contribute, you know, to maybe eight or nine races to now it's, you know, in our area in the valley, it's 30 or 40, I'm, not, I'm probably under that, and so it's, it's, it's difficult. So one of the great things about these commissions, you know, uh, you, you eliminate campaign, pretty much eliminate campaign funding. Uh, Commission members are, are generally better able to identify and seek out good candidates. I think you know, once you're on that commission, you, your duty is not only to, to vet candidates, it's to go out and, 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 and ask people to apply and, and, and encourage people to apply so that you do have a good pool to, uh, uh, to pick from. I think the uh, uh, the other advantage is, I guess, that, that that I saw is, or that you know, I saw in some of the studies is if the reappointment is done by retention election, it allows voters to, uh, to play a role in whether a judge should be retained or removed. And I know that one of the biggest concerns move that, that, that's been raised about you know, what we're doing is here is you're taking away you know, the right of the voters to elect their judges. And I think the retention uh, system allows the voters to still have part of that process. I think the, the biggest advantage that's usually cited is uh, of using judicial commissions is that it does deprive the public of the right to vote, and that's why I think the retention uh, system uh, allows, them, uh, allows them the right to vote. And, and it doesn't, uh, there's also an argument that it doesn't remove partisan politics because you've got members of each party selecting, you know, uh, uh, members you know, ostensibly of their party. Uh, it also, selection of judicial nominees does not screen well for political ideology. You're not looking at how oh, these guys liberal or, or or conservative, and I think that concerns a lot of people. Hey, let, let me ask you yeah. a question. Uh, regardless of how the members of this commission are selected, how do they in turn go about finding out who might be a good judge? How, how do they do that? How would members of the commission do that? Correct. Well, I, I think that goes back to the, you know, if, if you've got the statewide board, I think, it, you know, it's a little bit more difficult. Obviously, you, you would probably rely on on bar associations and other people to to, to, to to help you with that. But I think, you know, one of the arguments for the regional concept is that if you've got people in that region, I think, you know, they're better, they know that region, you know, better than other, you know, folks across the state. And so it, it, it seems to me that, you know, there's there's a good argument for a regional board. Others would say, no, it just needs, you know, it's easier if you just do a statewide board. But, uh, well, I, th you know. I think if you, if you want to be a judge, you're going to know that there's a commission and you can submit your name or be interviewed and so on and so forth, which is essentially what we do now with the governor's appointments office. But I, I guess my question really has to do with how the individual members of the commission would go about soliciting potential candidates. Um, I mean, shouldn't there be some kind of a criteria as opposed to them going to get their pals? 
uh, no, a, a friend or, or a friend of a client, you know, that type thing. I, I, I mean, I think that goes back to, you know, what, what uh, Chief Justice Jefferson talked about, you know, certification, having those qualifications and stuff. I think you've got to have some minimal qualifications so that way, you know, you're not just uh, getting, you know, somebody's buddy uh, to, to put their name up. And, and, uh, and so I, I think you could do that. I mean, that, that's one way to assure that you are getting. Uh, but I think, you know, and I think it's great to have, you know, non, non-lawyer non members because they do bring a different perspective. But the lawyer members will be important too because they're going to know the legal community. They're going to know who tries cases. They're going to know who's, who's experienced. And, uh, and so I think, you know, you, the panel, you know, it, it's, it's got to have lawyers on it. Uh, the biggest, one of the biggest criticisms they have of, of these commissions is that uh, they're not balanced. Uh, I think across most of the states, uh, they, they lack ethnic diversity in these commissions. They lack, uh, they tend to be more, you know, uh, more lawyers on these commissions. Uh, and, and so it hasn't worked well I, in some states. I think Minnesota, it has worked well because they, you know, they, it, it's half uh, lawyers, half non-lawyers. And I, I think that's a good balance and I think it's worked there, worked well there. So. Uh, those are kind of the options are out there. Those are the pros and cons. Uh, uh, I think the you know the, the right to elect judges is, is as we all know is gonna, is very important to a lot of people, and that's going to be a be a big issue. Yes, yes. Henry Hinojos. It, it would seem to me that the different venues can, can be used to uh, whenever they're soliciting lawyers, and you can list the minimum minimum qualifications that are needed to be able to apply. Uh, I mean, that's one way of doing it. I mean, I think all of us. Uh, who work in the legal profession have different ways of state bar, emails, the local bar uh, for <coughs> groups uh, that, that to notify, hey, we're now soliciting applications for a judgeship or a court of appeals, 30 court of appeals or Supreme Court, Supreme Court. This is the minimum qualification to apply. That's mm -hmm. pretty much mm -hmm. the initial step from my perspective. I know there's at least one state, I don't remember which one it was, but everybody who applies actually gets interviewed by the commission. And so the commission does get to make a determination on who it will even consider. Uh, and I, I'm sure that's an attempt to open it up. I'm, I'm not saying recommending that at all, but one thing that struck me as we read all these different studies is there's something, honestly, something different in every state, yeah. that they're grappling with every aspect of what we've talked about. But on these commissions, who they are, how they're elected, you know, who, what, what uh, jurisdictions they cover. Some states even have it where there's a commission for the Supreme Court, but not for their district courts. And now this is going to be a shock. Some have it where it's district courts and not Supreme mm -hmm. Courts. So uh, there's all kinds of answers. Uh, but, but I think I think every state is a product of its history. Sure, that and, and, and Texas certainly has a long, glory history. A so point. we're a product of our history as well. And you know, we've elected judges a long time. So if there's going to be any change uh, in our system, we've got to be very mindful of that. <laughs> Yes, Chip. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. I have not heard any proposal uh, from any of our subcommittees that say we're going to do away with the uh, the citizens having some role in electing judges, because nobody says that we're going to just go to a straight appointment system. Every, everything I've heard is there's at least retention, so the citizens have a right to do that. The thing that I worry about with, with having these, uh, <clears throat> with a commission or a citizens panel, <clears throat> make the recommendation is that you're taking now one step further away from the citizens when you have a non-elected group of people who you know I don't know who selects them but they're not certainly not the people they're not elected by the people as opposed to uh, having a governor who is elected by the people or the Senate or, or the House or a combination of the legislature who are elected by the people making the appointment. And uh, that's an observation. The question, I think, uh, to Representative Landgraf is, in House Bill 4505, uh, it looked to me like the appointment process was delegated to the legislature. And I wondered why you all, is that right? Maybe I, maybe I read it wrong. No, no, that's, that's not right. The, okay. the appointment process originates with the governor's okay. office. And then once the governor uh, announces an appointee, then there is the 
advisory board that would make a recommendation to the Senate as okay. that appoints you being unqualified, qualified, or highly qualified. Then, the, then there's the Senate confirmation process followed by the retention election uh, okay. process a, after that judge has been appointed okay. for, and confirmed. And another point, I just uh, listened to your comment. Well, yes, uh, it, it is a non-elected commission that is making recommendations to the governor, let's say the top three. Uh, the governor has the final say so with Senate confirmation or whatever. But, but we do that on a regular basis. We set up a blue panel commission, committee, to make recommendations to the legislature, and then we vote on it. The commission itself is not elected directly by the voters. Same thing as here. Uh, the commissioner we're talking about in our discussions not elected by the voters, but so they can make a recommendation to the elected. Uh, I mean, so I, I don't really see much difference in uh, when we appoint a group panel committee or group panel commission on different issues that impact the, the constituents, the state, uh, make recommendations to the legislature, and then we make a decision based on the recommendations. So, yeah. Uh, but I, I, but I, I agree with you on that, that we should not minimize uh, what participation, the retention uh, is one way of doing that in, in the system we're discussing. Yeah, I think that's very important myself. The, the other question I have, and this is more mechanical, I think, but uh, how, how the governor, of course, has a system of appointments. I mean, he's got an appointment secretary and a, a whole group that, that vets people and appoints them. How would this commission, would they have money? Would they have staff? Uh, how how would they how would the committee if they're going to make the recommendations in the first instance as opposed to passing on somebody uh, that the governor selects how are they going to mechanically do that yes money and staff mm -hmm. resources um, and in some states the commissioners <laughs> are are confirmed by the senate um, so that gives some uh, participation that way but yeah, you would have to make it a very uh, supported network <coughs> where they they could uh, have um, uh, help vetting these candidates and looking at the qualifications and all that and presenting something. In Arizona, the commission is uh, chaired by the chief uh, justice. And as I said, it was, it's, my, it's, it's majority non-lawyer members, although there is a lawyer, um, very significant lawyer uh, contribution. And their voices are heard, you know, um, by the public. Maybe one thing we have to do sometime, uh, I don't know if there'll be time for this, but is to do, get a video, I mean, get one of their, their sessions and just kind of look and see what happens at these commission meetings. Um, I, I think it, it'd be illuminating uh, because you're looking at, it, it, it'd be like, uh, right now, do you, you don't vote. Um, <laughs> you, you, don't, uh, you, you, you don't rely on the voters to choose who's going to operate on your heart you know, or, or based on political you know, affiliation or, or, or that sort of thing. What you do is, you know, where did this doctor go to school and, and what his, you know, how many um, legal, I mean, medical malpractice actions, and, you know, what, what's his expertise, and is he certified, you know, and, and that's the kind of thing that these commissions really look at. It's not, it's not, uh, it's, it's more merit. Than, than but I think the question is, on how, how are we should uh, fund it? Right. Uh, I, I would say the legislature, uh, they need to provide the tools and resources yeah. the staff to be able to properly do their job yeah. in this type of situation. You wouldn't want to depend on on contributions from the legal profession or, or private sector. I mean, that, that, this is really a public policy issue. Uh, so I, it would have to be the legislature to provide the proper funding to hire the proper staff to staff them uh, and, and the resources they need to do the job. As I understand what you're talking about in terms of public accountability, if the governor appoints half the commission, mm -hmm. all the commission, points all these judges uh, and that becomes a problem then the governor of course can be voted out right the governor owns that yeah okay all right any other questions of Lynn or David before we move on okay there being none um, the next item has to do with polling and future testimony and let me uh, talk about those a little bit separately um, I have talked to one of the subcommittees about polling. Uh, do we want to poll? Uh, we got that 2014 Texas Tech poll, uh, you know, uh, which provides some information. The fact of the matter is, polling is expensive. 
Um, and I know that at least one estimate was $50,000 for the type of poll that we might be interested in doing just to focus on a, a discrete uh, set of issues. What, what, are, what are the commissioner's views on that? I mean, is, is that worthwhile? I mean, is it, it may tell us what people think, but, you know, I think people really cherish their right to vote. And, and I don't, if you ask them that, they're going to say yes. Um, so I, I guess I, I question, is there any real value in polling? And if so, what is that value? So let me just kind of throw that open. I, I don't. In my opinion, I don't think there's much value in polling on this issue because uh, I guarantee you, just like many um, judicial elections, the judges don't even know what I mean, the, the voters don't even know the judges are. Uh, my pleasure to understand how the system is completely run. For me, uh, obviously, the voters say, "Well, I, I don't want to lose my right to vote. I don't want, I don't want to lose my right to have a choice." Uh, <coughs> so I, I, I don't see. There's value, but I don't think that there's enough value for us to uh, go through a poll of our general public on this issue. Well, there's a lot of data out there, uh, and we can certainly collect data and we can analyze that data. <coughs> but in terms of polling and incurring the expense, which, by the way, we don't have, we only have $20,000 that's been approved by the legislature. Isn't that right? Just 20? No, we have, we have more than that. Oh, we do? It's just the 20000 is for travel. For travel expenses. Okay. So we've got a little bit. I don't know if we've got enough money to do any significant polling, though. Um, but does anybody see any value uh, at this point in, in polling? Mr. Chairman, not, I don't at this stage. Now, maybe if we drill down to something that's more specific at a later date when the commission has done a little bit more of its work, maybe then, but certainly uh, I wouldn't think so at this point in time. Okay. Yeah, anybody I, disagree I agree, with that? I agree with no. that. Okay. Thank you. Let me move on to the next point then, which has to do with uh, appearances before our commission. Uh, we've had several people that have uh, requested to appear before the commission. Uh, TLR has requested permission. Uh, CJL uh, has requested permission and said they'd be willing to come to our next meeting if, if uh, we're agreeable. Uh, I'm inclined to ask them to appear before our group and any other group because we're going to have to give notice to the public about the fact that we're now accepting you know, public testimony. But does anybody have any uh, problem with in inviting at least the two that have requested thus far, which is uh, uh, TLR and CJO? Have them appear at our next meeting, March 6th. Okay, there being no uh, no nays, as they say. That's the day the Alamo fell. That's not it. That we will uh, invite them to appear at our next meeting, and maybe we're going to have to get out a notice to everybody just to kind of let them know that we're now accepting requests to appear before the commission to testify. Well, you can have you can also have invited testimony and save public testimony for a, a separate meeting. And if you want to do that as well. Well, with these two groups, I suspect they're going to have specific proposals that they have in mind that they're going to want to make. So um, I'm not sure we ought to just, that's going to take a lot of discussion is my point, uh, plus whatever else the subcommittees come up with. So I think that at this point, we probably ought to lean towards limiting it to that. And then the next time, uh, maybe have uh, testimony of anybody who wants to appear. Is that agreeable with the commission? Okay. Um, another subject has to do uh, with having hearings in different parts of the state because you're going to have a lot of people that may want to have input. They're not going to come to Austin to testify. Uh, and so the question is, should we go, you know, to Midland, to the Valley, uh, you know, elsewhere around the state? Uh, uh, what are your views on that? I mean, is there anybody who... Yeah, Chip. Uh, I, I'm strongly in favor of that. Um, I think that that we need to get out of Austin and we need to go down to the Valley and to East Texas and Midland and hear what uh, people have to say. Uh, people may have very strong views, but they either don't have the resources or the time to come to Austin to talk to us. And, you know, we are representing the people, um, as Senator Birdwell said, and, and we need to hear what the people have to say. Okay. Anybody disagree with that? No, I, 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 don't, I don't disagree, Mr. Chairman. My only caveat would be you've got to make sure that there's not an institutional inertia where it's only the legal profession for testifying. Um, a lot of commissioners' courts meet at, at 9 in the morning. Nobody's there because everybody's at work. 
I'll go wherever you tell me to go for any hearing, any time. It just needs to be done in a way that the average citizen is showing up, not just the legal community of the region that we go to. Good point. They may not show. Yeah. Kind of like on voting. They may just choose not to. But you got to give them that opportunity to do so. I think we're, we're as, as we get into the different communities, I think we're going to get a, a lot more spirit yeah. in the discussion. Well, I, I, I think in terms of scheduling, um, as Senator Nichols told me this morning, he said, you know, he's, his schedule is kind of locked in for the next couple of months. So if we're going to go elsewhere, it's got to be far enough in advance to where it can be scheduled in. So I'm mindful of that. And because I know you legislators have very, you know, rigid schedules. <coughs> If we do skip, well, when we schedule something, it'll be far enough to where hopefully it'll fit into your, your overall schedules. Let us give you some options too on dates. You know, I, we, I'm on the redistricting committee and uh, I hear about uh, half a dozen committee hearings throughout the state of Texas. Yeah. He's on natural resources. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe something can be scheduled to coincide with some of those. <laughs> yeah. uh, those this, will, this will be a joint meeting of the natural resources. We're already doing that with water, water yeah. so you know, <laughs> water and rural affairs. Uh, uh, so. Okay, uh, remember our next meeting is March 6th. Uh, Megan has agreed to kind of monitor the media coverage on our meetings and circulate uh, that to the members of the commission so that you'll be. You may know there was uh, some coverage after our last meeting. San Antonio had a, an op-ed, uh, uh, which was a nice article about our challenges, uh, and that was circulated. Uh, we'll obtain some sample ballots, uh, hopefully, Keith, from your office, uh, that we can circulate to the members of the commission. Uh, we'll circulate the data we have on the percentage of appointments of our judges today, so that you'll know what the percentages are and have that in your file. We will also provide a, uh, a breakdown of the board specialization. I know David reported it was a little around 7%, but I'd like you to know what, what's real estate, what's litigation, and so on, because I think that's going to make that percentage <coughs> lower if we're talking about our courts. Um, and then the uh, other state uh, commissions. We need to come to, to, to rest, Senator Birdwell, on what we're going to do with respect to this survey. Uh, you need to have input on this. Um, so, uh, Tom, when would you anticipate wanting to get this out, but at the same time allow sufficient time for members of the commission to talk to you about it? Uh oh. Because they just got it this morning. Right. And I I'm, I do not think time is of the essence. In other words, I don't think three and a half weeks wrecks the plan of salvation. Uh, <laughs> I'm interested in... Uh, he says three and a half weeks. He says it would be fine too. Uh, I'm very interested in the other two committees looking at this and seeing if there's something they want to throw in because I think Nathan can get pretty good reaction to the first survey, but if he starts handing out two or three or four, it might not. It well, why don't we do this and see if this is agreeable to everyone. Our next meeting is March 6. Right, everybody has a copy of this now, and you're going to circulate it again electronically. Um, provide whatever comments uh, you have to uh, former Chief Justice Phillips and Megan. Uh, if you want to talk to uh, uh, Tom, feel free to talk to him, and then we will address it at our next meeting. Yeah. I, think okay. what, I, I think what we'd like to have is some deadline before the meeting okay. where we have proposed questions on there to talk about, or proposed deletions or changes. So maybe a week out before that meeting. Yeah, well, it will be on the agenda for our next meeting, so that hopefully the commissioners will be prepared to address it at our March 6th meeting. But, but he wants comments from the commissioners before a week so the, before So we that. send those out in writing. And you don't get here on March the 6th, and there's 22 changes, and then people uh, say we need till April. I see what you're saying. So yeah. in other words, I'd like to see this. I hope we can get this mailed out. One really good questionnaire. So. Um, if I send it out today to everyone, if we make the deadline for comments or changes, um, the 28th, that's a week before. So that gives you almost three weeks that's to look at it. That's great. February 28th. And then we'll February send out before the meeting the final a version. compilation of those. I mean, mm -hmm. either, either changes 
that are so obvious they need to go in there are proposals that, that we want to see if there's any opposition and if there's some we think I don't think there'll be any that are real controversial but if they are we'll put those in for discussion and Megan if you could give us like a day reminder before they're due so <laughs> yeah. we all work on deadlines <laughs> And don't one. make it the <laughs> night after a basketball UT basketball. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm done going to UT basketball. Games this day. Go Baylor. <laughs> okay, and, and uh, Chief Justice Jefferson, we will see if we can track down uh, a, a commission session from another state to see if it's something that we may want to show our commission. Okay, great. What, what's the best way to do that? Would that be to work through Chief Justice Hack or? Uh, Megan is in touch with people. Okay. So I, I would say, you know, you know, I was I would call Arizona first and, and just see if they if they can uh, sense okay. the Can you do that, Megan? Okay. David. Yeah. Yes, Dan. Uh, uh, I'll volunteer for our working group to see if I can synthesize the questions that would relate particularly to the areas that we're supposed to study. And maybe that would be helpful, Senator Berlin. And not that you'd be restricted to what I do, but but I can maybe make some proposals and circulate them around. And that at least help on that step a little bit. But just suggest. just on R two. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I would like another charge from you on what, if anything, my subcommittee and I presume the others are supposed to be doing for the next meeting. Should we come up with a written draft of some sort? Uh, I'm working at a snail's pace on a history of how different states fell between elections between partisan and nonpartisan elections for instance I, I think it would be helpful if all of our subgroups uh, prepared a written report um, and shared with all the members of the commission I know Lynn's uh, subgroup has already done that uh, but Tom and Wallace if you could do that and just you know stamp a tentative draft however you want to do it so that everybody's aware this is not a final recommendation it's just really Kind of the state of, of what you so, investigated and accomplished so far. Only Wallace's group kind of came up with this idea is better than another idea, or these two ideas are better than fourteen others. Do you want that from? Well, I, mean, I think it's important that you list basically what you talked about this morning, which is the pros and cons of the various uh, options that your subgroup is looking at. Okay. Because that, at some easy. point, we're going to have to write a report. It would be nice if all the commissioners had these documents to refer back to whenever you're trying to synthesize your thoughts. Because um, what, what I see hopefully happening is that you know we, we do exactly what the legislature has mandated, is that we look at all these alternative options, discuss the advantages and disadvantages of each, and then make whatever recommendations, plural, that we think are appropriate based upon all the work we've done. And then it's up to the legislature to decide what, what it is they want to do, if anything. Yes. Chairman Beck, uh, what Mr. Babcock said about the, uh, moving to other cities, uh, how will that be determined? Are we going to just go northeast, west, south? or You, you mean other parts of Texas? Selecting yeah, other cities. Yeah, just send me any suggestions you have. I mean, we're kind of time limited in a way because we've got to have our report by the end of this calendar year to the legislature and everybody's got a busy schedule so you know what I would contemplate is certainly the valley certainly West Texas let's say Midland uh, the question is do we go out to El Paso uh, East Texas I think we've got to go to East Texas uh, North Texas maybe uh, so those are just my thoughts but if you've got any specific recommendations let me know and then I'll circulate that to the members of the Commission and then you all can agree or disagree I just asked that question, Chairman, because I know that once we decide, there are going to be some dissatisfied individuals. Yeah. So we better have some logic and reason to how we decide. Excellent point. Excellent point. Yeah. Great point. Is it your uh, anticipation right now that? All of us, or as many as possible, would try to make each one of these hearings, and then we would hold this meeting our monthly meeting in conjunction with being somewhere else or that we just send out a delegation like if we can get three or four to El Paso we're doing great and our meetings would continue to be in Austin monthly yeah that's a great question and I don't know the answer to it frankly because if we schedule a bunch of meetings and we can only get three or four members of our commission 
that are available on that date, we may want to just use a delegation. Um, I mean, I'd like to have the full commission at every one of these, but I think realistically that's not going to happen. I just don't think everybody's going to be available on all of these dates. Uh, so we, what we may need to do is to just uh, try to get everybody, and if we can't, then just use a delegation. But if we have everybody, we can hold a meeting. Then. Well, that, I mean, there's two different ways to go. We can send three to five people to more locations and say, right. we're really interested in what you have to say in Paris, Texas or something. Mm -hmm. Or the whole commission can go, but we won't be able to go to very many spots. And that's a balance I leave to you. Okay. But if we just send out delegations, then it seems to me we would keep these monthly meetings in custom. <coughs> But if we try to go to a few places, all of us, then our monthly meeting should be there at the after the hearing. I agree. Okay, uh, that is all we have on today's agenda. Anything else that anybody would like to bring up for the good of the cause? If not, we are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Yeah. Okay. So, 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 so,